Have you ever thought about how NestJS actually handles the creation and lifetime of a provider? I have here an app service, which is a provider. It's decorated with at injectable. And if you take a look here, we can pass in some options. One of the options that we can pass in is the scope property. By default, if you don't pass in anything, Nest is going to be using this default value. So if we were to actually not explicitly set anything here, this is equivalent to actually setting it as default. And 90% of the times, we don't really need to specify anything, meaning it's going to be a default scoped provider. And before we move on and explain what that, what does that mean, scope basically stands for the lifetime of a certain provider. Meaning, when does Nest.js actually create that provider and how long does it live before being destroyed and removed from memory? This is what scope means. And if you take a look here, specifies the lifetime of an injected provider or controller. That's right, we can also use it inside of a controller. So we could specify the controller scope just as we can do with a provider. Now we said that by default, if you don't specify anything, it's going to have the scope.default uh, value here. And what this does is it actually behaves as a singleton. So every single provider in your application, okay, is going to be a singleton by default, meaning Nest.js goes ahead and creates one single instance, which is which it will also be using throughout your whole application. So it's going to be one shared instance. Its lifetime starts from as soon as the app is running until the app execution stops. And to make sure of that, let's go ahead and add a constructor and then add a log. And if you take a look here, we can see we got the first log from Nest Factory starting Nest application. And then as soon as this is done, we got app service instance created, meaning Nest.js automatically went ahead and created this provider as a singleton. It will be reused. The same instance will be reused. If you go back here and also remove this or add this log inside of our app controller constructor, we can see that first Nest.js went ahead and created this app service provider instance. And then of course, since controller depends on it, it was able to create a new instance of this controller. Now, if we open Postman and hit send, I'm going to make many requests. If you go back here, we can see that we don't have any new logs, meaning we are still using the same instance of this app controller and the same instance of this app service provider. And that's because, like we said, by default, Nest.js uses the scope.default uh, scope, meaning this is going to be a singleton. Let's see what happens if instead of default, we actually change the behavior to request. First of all, we noticed that we don't have any constructor logs. So we got this starting nest application log and we don't even got a app service instance created. So Nest.js has not yet created an instance of this provider nor an instance of this controller. Now let's see what happens if we hit send here. If you go back to our logs, we can see that now we got a new instance of our service created. So Nest.js went ahead and created a new instance as soon as we made a request to our server. And this is because our provider is now request scoped, meaning a new instance will be created on every request. And to verify that, let's go ahead and send one, two, three requests. And as you can see, we got more logs. So for every request, we're getting a new instance of this app service provider and a new instance on this app controller. Now, the reason app controller is uh, being treated as a request scoped controller, even though we did not specify this here, is because app controller depends on a provider, which happens to be request scoped. Again, if we remove this and run our server again, as you can see, automatically Nest.js generated an instance of each. And now for every request that we make, it is going to be using the same instances. No new instances were created. But as soon as we specify this as a request scoped, Nest.js is going to wait until we make a request to actually create those new instances. Now, you might be asking yourself, why would you even need to have a request scoped provider? Well, like we said, 90% of the times, you're not going to need one. But in some scenarios, if you don't use a request scoped provider, but rather use the, the default singleton behavior, you will end up with wrong behaviors. And we're going to see an example of that. And we're going to name a few use cases where you will have to actually use a request scoped provider. I went ahead and created a provider 
request matrix servers and I specified the scope to be request scoped again meaning for every request that needs to access this service nest.js is going to create a new instance of this service to be used and then it will destroy it and remove it from memory now what this does basically just has a start time, the database query count, how many times we actually queried our database, and an API call count, how many times we have made API calls to fetch maybe responses or whatever. And inside of our constructor, we're gonna set the start time to the current time. And then we have a few methods just to increment the database query count and to increment this uh, API call count. I also have a format time method. We don't really need to care about this. And finally, we have this get metrics method, which is going to return some metrics like the request start time, request end time, database query count, and API call count. Now let's see how we can use this and how the scope here changes the behavior. I have here an app service, which depends on request metrics. And since request metrics service is request scoped, of course, like we said, this service is also going to be request scoped. And since this service is request scoped, then the controller that uses it is also going to be request scoped, meaning a new instance is going to be created per request. Now, if you take a look here, I'm simulating a few things. We already said that request metrics is used to get some metrics about the request, such as the number of API calls we had to make, the number of database queries and so on. So inside of get products, I'm just going to simulate that we made a query to our database. So what I did is I called this request metric service and then called increment database query. So now the count would be one. And then we're going to assume that we made two API calls to get maybe some external data for our products. So I called this increment API call method twice. So now the API call count would be two. And then uh, I'm simulating a wait time of two seconds until everything is done and finally I'm going to return an array of products. Now to make use of this getMetrics method inside of our request metric service which is again a request code provider it will be a new instance will be created on every request I went ahead and created an interceptor you don't really need to worry about that it's just to reshape the response so that I can add the metrics on top of the data. So here I also injected this request metric service and called get metrics. Now by default, we said that whenever we have a request scoped provider, okay, any controller or any other provider that depends on it or injects it will automatically have the request scope here without us having to add it. However, for interceptors that depend on request scoped providers, we have to register the interceptor as request scoped and to do that in app module for example i went ahead and used this app interceptor from nest.js uh, core as our token and then i of course specified the class of our interceptor and here i had to specify request scoped so for interceptors we have to specify the scope manually whenever we are injecting a request scoped provider but for controllers and other providers, we don't even need to specify that explicitly. Now, let's see how our response is going to look like. Again, we are simulating a two seconds wait here, and then it's going to return the metrics on top of the data here. So let's see what happens when we call this route. As you can see, after two seconds, we got a response. The start time is 17, 20, 48, this is the seconds, and then the request end time is the same time, however, after two seconds it ended, so from 48 to 50. And we can see that we have one database query count and two API call counts. And that's because here we have simulated some API calls and a database query. Now, of course, if you take a look at our logs, we got app service initialized, which is this service. And of course, if we had added a log here inside of our request metric service, we would see that a new one was initialized. But now if we hit send again, take a look at the values, they have changed. The request start time has changed. The request end time has changed. But the database query count and the API call count are still the same, of course, because here it created a new instance of this request metric service. So it was reinitialized to zero again when it was created. And that's because it's request scoped. However, if this was the default scope, meaning a singleton, if we save again, 
if I hit send, if you take a look here, the app service was initialized at launch and not when we hit send. Okay, we got, of course, the request start time, API call count two, database query count one, and that's because, again, we have specified those numbers here. But this time, if you take a look here, those will not be reinitialized to zero because it's a default scope, meaning singleton. So now if I hit send again, take a look at the numbers. As you can see, the API call count is now four and the database query count is now two. And that's because we are using the same request matrix service. So the values are not being reinitialized because we're still using the same instance that NestJS created at the beginning. And now if I hit send again, notice it will go to three and six. And this is wrong because in this specific request, we did not actually make six API calls nor three database query count. And this request was not made at 58 seconds. It was made at 47 seconds. So as you can see here, using the default scope, which is the de default behavior, would cause wrong results here in our metrics. However, if we went ahead and used the request scope, so at each request, we are making a new instance. So we are reinitializing those values to zero. We are going to get the correct results. So if you take a look at the request start time, now it's correct. It took two seconds. If you hit send again, the start time updated and those numbers were reinitialized. So this is now the correct behavior. This is one example where we should use request scoped rather than singletons. Now, another good use case for request code providers is in multi-tenancy applications. So let's say your application have multiple tenants and every tenant has their own database. For every request that you make, you are going to change this tenant database connection. And this tenant connection service takes care of initializing this DB connection based on maybe the request uh, tenant ID or something else, and then providing it to your other services to uh, connect to the correct database when making your queries and so on. So in this example, as you can see, since for every request we need to change this tenant DB connection, it shouldn't be a singleton. It should be a request scoped service. Now, I wanna show you one more thing before ending this video. Let's say we remove this option here. So like we said, by default, it's going to be a singleton here, not a request scoped. But let's say inside of our constructor, we go ahead and use this inject decorator to inject a a request reference here so by using the request token and this is from this should be from nestjs core and let's call it request for example this gives us access to the request object that was made so by default since inside of our constructor we depend on the actual request made then even though we didn't specify the scope here as request scoped this provider is going to be a request scoped provider this is just a side note here uh, that's basically it. Like we said, 90% of the times, you're not going to specify anything. You're going to use the default singleton behavior of the providers, 90% of the chance of the times. But for some use cases, like the ones that we specified, you might need to have a different context for every request and so on. So request scoped would be a good fit here. If this video was helpful. Please make sure to leave a like, subscribe, comment if you have any questions, and I will see you next time.